and welcome to the program. I am Ama Marcus. For the first time in 14 years, there has been a significant change in the balance of power in Britain. The centre-left Labour Party currently holds 410 seats in Parliament, giving them a majority of 131 seats, while the Conservatives have 131 seats. While the head of Labour Party, Keir Starmer, will take over as Prime Minister. We did it! You campaigned for it, you fought for it, you voted for it, and now it has arrived. Change begins now. And it feels good, I have to be honest. Four and a half years of work changing the party. This is what it is for. A changed Labour Party, ready to serve our country, ready to restore Britain to the service of working people. Yeah. And across our country, People will be waking up to the news, relieved that a weight has been lifted, a burden finally removed from the shoulders of this great nation. And now we can look forward again, walk into the morning, the sunlight of hope, pale at first, but getting stronger through the day. Since I moved here a decade ago, you have made me and my family feel so at home, and I look forward to continuing to serve as your Member of Parliament. It is an enormous privilege. I'm grateful to my agent and constituency team, and I congratulate my opponents here on the energetic and very good-natured campaigns that they have run. The Labour Party has won this general election, and I have called Sir Keir Starmer to congratulate him on his victory. Today, power will change hands in a peaceful and orderly manner, with goodwill on all sides. That is something that should give us all confidence in our country's stability and future. The British people have delivered a sobering verdict tonight. There is much to learn and reflect on, and I take responsibility for the loss. To the many good, hard-working Conservative candidates who lost tonight, despite their tireless efforts, their local records of delivery, and their dedication to their communities, I am sorry. I will now head down to London where I will say more about tonight's result before I leave the job of Prime Minister, to which I have given my all. I will then return here, to my family's home, and I look forward to spending more time with you all in the weeks, months and years ahead. What these means for the British public and, of course, the future of Britain is what we are discussing this morning. Well, joining us is Fola Kumi Finero. He is a PhD in law candidate from the University of Cambridge. Hello, Mr. Fola Kumi. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hi, Alice. It's good to speak with you. All right. So let's talk about these results. Were there surprised or this was totally expected? I know the Labour the Labour was uh, built to win this election. So was it a total surprise or was this scene coming? Yeah, I think it was uh, not really a surprise, to be honest. So the Conservatives have been in power for the last 14 years um, since they won power in 2010. And since then, we've had... Um, I think it's about five conservative prime ministers, uh, including Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. And they've just sort of been competing to see who can um, deteriorate the, com the country's economy and, and the, the cost of living um, more than the, the last one. So I think it's been quite a, uh, um, a long time coming, to be honest, because, you know, the, the country from 2010 is in such a worse place Um and of course, there's the global issues as well. So there's the uh, the COVID pandemic that happened that made things particularly worse. Um, there's also um, the the war in Ukraine and in um, Israel and Gaza. Uh, uh, but there's also been choices made by the Conservative Party that have led to the UK situation being significantly worse than it, it otherwise needed to be. Um, so, for example, Brexit, which has 
you know reduce the um the, the cost of living uh, so increase the cost of living um it's made goods more coming from the eu more expensive um a big problem here is also to do with immigration um and under the conservatives the net migration has skyrocketed they've completely lost control of the borders um and you see that the uk is becoming or has been becoming increasingly more isolated on the global stage um so because of all these things i think there's been a lot of um, frustration building up with the conservative party um and, and not to mention there's also been a lot of um, misconduct as well so there was there was uh, you know an investigation that was had shortly after the pandemic that showed that you know while people had to be self-isolating and um, unable to spend time with their loved ones who were very ill uh, members of the conservative party were actually partying and that actually you know wasn't received very well by the um the uk public and so if you've seen all these things it just sort of um reeks of complacency and mismanagement of the country and so um inevitably this kind of outcome was going to happen okay so this margin of victory what does it mean for both the labor party and how does sakir starmer's priorities can be put in place moving forward for the economy yeah so the, the margin of victory was always what people were debating about so it wasn't really a question of will labor win the question was how much will they win by and it, this was quite telling that the conservatives had actually even given up on the election because uh, shortly before the election, I saw a tweet by Rishi Sunak saying that don't give Labour a super majority, right? And obviously, when you have to start telling the electorate not to elect your uh, opponent in large numbers, of course, you're, you're effectively announcing defeat. Um, so, yeah, so the, the margin of, of victory was quite a surprise, I think, because they, they've won quite by quite a significant margin. Um, so they've Last time I checked, they had just over 400 votes, so 400 members of parliament in the in the UK House of Commons. Um, and in order to get bills passed, um, they need to have uh, 325 members of parliament voting for them. So that gives them a margin of about 80 members of parliament that they can play with. And that gives uh, Keir Starmer a huge mandate to work on to implement his agenda. So he's spoken about in the manifesto, um, having 40,000 more doctor appointments in the UK, um, 13,000 more police officers, 6,500 more teachers. There's a lot of um, that will be pumped into the UK economy. And so I think um, having the, the leeway um, to have such a huge majority, by having such a huge majority will allow them to um, pass a lot of these legis le relevant legislation and to govern the country in accordance to their, their vision and their mandate. Mm. What about the Conservatives? After 14 years in power, where does this leave the Conservative Party and also Rishi Sunak? Yeah, so I think that the Conservatives at the moment face a bit of an identity crisis. Um, and so over the last few years, we've seen them since the Brexit referendum, we've seen them sort of shift increasingly more to the right. Um, so they've come out harder on things like immigration, for example, um, and I'm, I'm sure the Nigerian listeners will know about the, the removal of dependents coming in on student visas, for example. Um, we've also seen them um, take, take quite a, a, a hard um, uh, line on, on taxation as well, and they've been increased the tax, that people are paying more tax here than they ever have in the UK. Um, and so we, we, we've, um, we've seen them sort of uh, panic a little bit um, and in an attempt to get votes. And I think this is best sort of spelled out by just a few days before the election was announced, um, uh, Rishi Sunak announced that they will be imposing a national service, um, which clearly is an attempt to um, cater to the older generation who they feel is the um, largest demographic uh, of voters. Um, and so they really face this identity crisis because clearly that shift towards the right uh, hasn't worked for them. Um, it's also led to them being um, vulnerable to being outflanked by an even more right-wing party like the Reform Party. Um, and so, yeah, I think they'll, they'll really face a choice of what direction do they want to go in at the next election. Um, and that all starts with, I mean, probably in the next few weeks, we'll find out who the next leader of the Conservative Party will be. Um, as I think just before I came online, Rishi Sunak announced that he would step down and 
resign as leader. He actually said that he feels the anger of the country and their frustration with the last 14 years of conservative rule. And so I think it'd be interesting to see who comes in next. Um, there's people touting Kemi Badenot, for example, who is uh, Nigerian and was the former uh, business secretary. Um, she actually was in Nigeria um, earlier this year to secure a trade deal between the UK and Nigeria. Um, there's also people starting James Cleverly, um, and and there's a few other names in the in the in being put in the ring. But interestingly, um, because of the scale of the the loss for the for the Conservatives, some of the people that would have previously been seen as uh, leaders, so like Penny Mordens, for example, and, and potentially Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, they've actually lost their seats because of just how emphatic the Labour victory has been. And these were people who had traditionally conservative seats. Um, so it's that, that's been quite a surprise. So I think there's a narrow pool for the um, conservatives to choose from when selecting their next leader. Mm. But there is another political force here, and that's the man named Nigel Farage. He is the leader of the right-wing populist party, Reform UK party. Now, where does this recent line of events leave him? Yeah, so N Nigel Farage is someone who's run for member of parliament, I think, seven times. And this, so this is his uh, eighth time lucky getting in. And he's running on the platform, or he's run on the platform of the Reform UK Party, um, which is uh, an offshoot of the Brexit Party, which was trying to get Brexit done, and which is also an offshoot of the, the UK Party, which was trying to get Brexit on the political agenda. Um, and so it, this sort of demographic and uh, I guess consciousness has sort of been morphing into the reform party that we see today. And they're incredibly radical. A lot of their policies um, focus on uh, immigration and how the increased level of levels of immigration, immigration that have been seen um, under the Conservative Party have led to a deterioration of um, health care services, um, education services, infrastructure. Um, and so a lot of their policies focus on clamping down on the, the level of immigration and also on climate change as well. So the, the net zero targets that the Conservative Party and Labour Party have identified as things that will help to improve the economy and to make it more sustainable. Um, the Reform Party is completely against that. So they want to completely remove net zero and use the cost savings from net zero to invest in the public services. Um, and so... Where does this leave them? You know, they won four seats, which is the most any of these parties. So the UK party, the um, uh, the Brexit party and reform, the most that any of those parties have ever won. I think the highest ever was um, in the mid 2010s, won by when, when UK had two members of parliament and two, two seats. And so this is you know quite a, a, a huge um, increase for them. Um, but what's particularly interesting is that they actually won 14% of the, uh, the the general uh, pop, uh, popular votes. Um, and the way the UK election works is that, it, the, the electoral system works is that it doesn't matter how many um, votes you get across the country. The most important thing is that you have to win particular seats. And so a lot of the time you see that the reform was coming second or third and it, it was, there were quite a lot of close ties but they didn't actually get enough votes to actually win the seat. So they, that's why they have 14%. And just for context, I think the Conservatives have around just sort of 20% of the votes. Um, but obviously they were able to get 100 seats. And uh, Labour have just over 34% of the votes. And they were able to get 400 seats. And so you see the ways in which the electoral system has been skewed against smaller parties like Reform. And I think that people like Nigel Farage and Richard Tice, who's also one of the leaders of the Reform Party, will use this as a, a mandate to really press on with their agenda uh, and use that as a way to, to scrutinize the, the government um, and to try and you know, get some of their, their policies passed. Um, and you know, we've seen this in the election campaign. Uh, so one of the, the main slogans that the Reform Party was campaigning on was that um, Labour have effectively won the election. They have admitted that outright. And they gave the voters the question of who will be the opposition. And so they effectively see themselves as a credible opposition to the Labour government and a party that can really keep them in check. Um, 
And it'll be interesting to see because in Nigel Farage's um, victory speech, when he became, um, the, he won the, the, the seat in Clacton, um, which is one of the parliamentary seats in the UK, um, he actually announced that, well, you know, we were previously trying to go after the Conservative Party, but now we're focusing on Labour and we're trying to make sure that Labour um, uh, are, are scrutinised and, and held in check. Um, so we need to see how, how they go about doing that, given the fact that they only have four seats. But I, I Nigel Farage is one of the most savvy political um, operators in the UK. Um, he got UKIP to um, get the Brexit referendum on the agenda, even without having um, a substantial number of members of parliament. Um, and, and so, and he, he himself has never actually been in the House of Commons, and yet he's able, he's been able to have so much impact. So I wouldn't put it past him to sort of change the Overton window on some of these issues in a way that favors his um, own agenda. Okay. Uh, you, we, earlier when you spoke, you mentioned issues in the economy, migration. Now, could you tell us some of the issues this new government is going to help tackle at the moment? I know there's a cost of living crisis, the issues of migration, and of course, not forgetting the migration issue between Rishi Sunak, of course, and Rwanda. How will these, how will the Labour Party look to handle these issues? Well, on migration, they've come out and said that they're going to cancel the Rwanda scheme, which I find quite interesting um, because a lot of the Conservative Party and particularly Rishi Sunak um, sort of hinged their political careers on the success of the Rwanda scheme. So this is quite a a, a, a complete U-turn from the, the policy. Um, but instead, they, they, they decided to tackle the problem of illegal migration by establishing a, a command force that will monitor the borders of the UK and detain people and, and um, um, lock them up. Um, so uh, and charge them with crimes and, and, and lock them up. Um, and so I think the it, it'd be interesting to see how effective that is um, because we haven't had much detail on that in their manifestos. Um, but then I think fundamentally the problem that the UK faces is a changing demographic. Um, they have a massively aging population. Um, uh, you know, a lot of their people are getting very old, and and that that puts a strain on the public services like healthcare. Um, and so it'd be interesting to see how the Labour government tackles that because obviously um, immigration is necessary once you have a, an, an aging population. Um, it allows you to employ more people to fill up these roles that the UK population itself can't manage to fill. Um, but not, not just in, in the public services, but also in agriculture and farming and things like that. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how the Labour government is able to approach some of these issues um, you mentioned um, the, the the cost of living crisis. That's certainly one of the things that they're, they're focusing on. Um, they, they're, they're trying to put they put in their manifesto that they intend to cut the energy bills. Um, they want to also um, um, uh, they, they've also agreed not or, or said that they they're not going to increase the taxes that the um, conservative governments have put in place. Um, and they, they've also they also want to cap the um, corporation tax at a certain level as well so to sort of reduce the um the, the burden on on people but the question then is they have a lot of um, policies that they want to implement I mean, you know i mentioned earlier about hiring more teachers hiring more police officers more doctor appointments so the question then is where does the money for all these things come from if you're not willing to increase the tax base the labor answer will be that they want to invest in a broad-based industrial policy for the country um, which will be quite interesting to see what what sort, of, what sort of sectors that they want to focus on. Um, but if they do that, that would certainly be something that can create jobs and will create a lot of revenue that can be can be taxed. Um, the question then is, well, is the world ready for the UK to, um, is the UK competitive enough to, to dominate a particular industry or sector um, in the way that um, Kistama and, and his team would want to dominate um we've seen in the us the the passing of the the chips act which allows uh, or, or is, is meant to encourage the production of um, semiconductor chips within the us i think joe biden spent hundreds of billions of dollars um through it, it can spend hundreds of billions of dollars through this um this bill uh, this act rather um does the uk have that kind of money to invest in an industry uh, like like 
you know creating semiconductor chips it's, it's not it's not clear that that they do um so this would be an interesting challenge that the the uk governments the labor governments will have to face but this is a challenge that any government would have had to face the conservatives have had to face this as well it's not a new problem uh, but i think they need to really um, get to work as soon as possible to try and um uh, you know, sort of get some of these uh, mm. plans in motion. All right. So where would you say Labour stands in issues such as Brexit and, of course, their participation in the EU? Yeah, so uh, on, on Brexit, they, they've come out in their manifesto to say that they're not willing to rejoin the customs union. Um, and they've also come out to, to say that they want to negotiate a new EU-UK security pact. Um, they've also said that they, they, they would want to continue the support for Ukraine. So on issues of security and foreign policy, um, it seems that they're willing to still be aligned with the EU, but they're very cautious about um, getting into the point get, getting to the point of um, having free movements of goods and services um, a, a, in the way that sort of constrains the UK. Um, I think the, the Labour Party is very cautious um, around the issue of Brexit, um, of course, as you can imagine, it's a very sensitive topic in the UK, um, given how divisive the, the referendum was. Um, but the uh, Labour government has sort of tried to not particularly talk about the issue so much. It's not come up that much in the campaign. Um, it was seen that Brexit could have been a real game changer. I mean, I guess they won by quite a huge margin anyway, so they didn't need to bring it up. But a lot of political commentators were saying that you know, this would have been a real way to put the nail in the coffin of the Conservative Party because they really hinged their legacy on Brexit and it was not a success. So they, they, it's been interesting that Labour haven't gone down that route, so obviously because of how sensitive the topic is, but um, they seem to sort of be following in the same path as the Conservative Party. Right, and, and I think this has been sort of a, coach, a problem with the Labour Party because in an attempt to sort of get as many votes as possible and not alienate many people, they've sort of tried to toe a very centrist line. Um, so the question then will be, well, what kind of Labour Party will we see govern now that they're in power? Mm. Mr. Falakumi, before we let you go, what exactly can you tell us about the new British Prime Minister? Yeah, so, so Keir Starmer is, um, he was a, a lawyer, a human rights lawyer. Um, he came into politics quite late, so he's not one of the career politicians. Um, he came in because he felt like he had a, a, a public service calling. Um, he comes from a working class background. His wife works in the NHS, um, and he sort of, you know, prizes himself on being someone who is more relatable to the people, at least more so than um, Rishi Sunak, who, as we all know, is actually wealthier than the King of England. Um, and I remember there was a point in the debate when um, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer were, were asked um, whether they would send their ailing uh, member of family to the NHS. That, that this, they had, hypothetically, let's say they had a member of, uh, of their family that was very, very ill. Would they send them to the NHS or to the private doctor? And Keir Starmer outright said, no, I would send my kid, my my." Uh, family member to the NHS because that's what I've relied on my whole life. And Rishi Sunak said that he would send him to the private um, doctor. Oh. And so that I think that's quite telling of his, his character and the sort of background that he's had and how relatable he wants to see, to come across. But I guess a, a problem is that he came in before he became Labour uh, leader. He came in as someone who was sort of the heir to Jeremy Corbyn, who many people might know is was a former Labour leader and a very far left um, politician who's actually since left the Labour Party. And he left the Labour Party after effectively being kicked out by Keir Starmer. So it's funny to see that he came in as, you know, I'm the successor of, 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 of uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, this is why you should vote for me. I'm going to carry on his legacy. And then now, and this goes back to my previous point of Labour being more centrist. Now he sort of distanced himself from Jeremy Corbyn. He even distance himself from um, Diane Abbott a little bit. There was a bit of an issue there as well. And so I guess the problem is that because he's gone through this centrist strategy of trying to win as many votes as possible, 
a lot of people feel like they don't really know the real Keir Starmer and that only now that he's been elected will we really know who he is. Mm. Well, these are definitely interesting times in the British political scene and we'll be sure to keep an eye out. Thank you, Mr. Falakumi, for coming on the show and giving us those updates. We really appreciate you. Thank you very much. Okay.